Today is message number eight of this series, Road to Recovery. This will be the last message that I will share with you on this subject as we've introduced a ministry that we believe is going to revolutionize the church and our community. And again, that ministry is Celebrate Recovery. I've been sharing this because I'm trying to get you on my side. We're going to need a lot of help. We're going to need those that are called. I've been praying that God would bring those that are called to this ministry. Uh, Because, again, we really believe that we're going to reach so many different people. Those with the hurts and the habits and the hang-ups. And I love the program because it follows the 12 steps of AA and NA. But there's a major difference. It is Christ-centered and it is biblically based. And so when we get to that place of the higher power, it's not going to be a doorknob. It's going to be Jesus. And uh, we're excited about introducing this community to Jesus. Jesus is the one that set you free. He's the one who set me free. Religion didn't do this. Let me say it again. Religion didn't do this. Religion can't set you free. But Jesus can. And that's what we're introducing to this community is a person, not Christ, assembly of God, not a religion, not a denomination. We're introducing a person. Are you excited about it? Amen. Amen. So this will be the last one. Next Sunday, I'm going to show you a testimony of a a man named Jeff. I've stolen his statement where he said uh, that he was at one time a hopeless dope dealer. That was my life. I was a hopeless dope dealer. And today, he's a dopeless hope dealer, and that's who I am. So my name is Jeff Morrow. I'm the lead pastor of Calvary Assembly, for those that might not know me. And I am a follower and believer in Jesus Christ, and my Jesus delivered me from drugs and alcohol many years ago, called me into the ministry, and now, like Jeff, and that's my name, and you'll see his testimony. It's going to blow you away. We're finally going to be able to see it on the screens and the projectors, but Wait till you see this testimony of the one who came up with that statement. I'm telling you, it's going to rock your world. Uh, Bring as many people as you can because you want them to hear this testimony. The title of this message is The Good News. The Good News. If you've got your bulletin, uh, you notice in the middle for the last eight weeks, we've been sharing the eight principles of Celebrate Recovery and the 12 steps. And so as you open up that bulletin, Uh, I want us to look at principle number eight, and then we're going to read step 12, and I want you to read this with me. Principle number eight, this is the final goal of this road to recovery. Remember that recovery is a process. You did not get yourself into this mess overnight. You're not going to get yourself out of this mess overnight. You're going to have to go through the process of recovery, but this is the end game. If you want to know where we're trying to get people to, here it is. Let's look at the why of recovery, and let's read it together. Yield myself to God to be used to bring this good news to others, both by my example and my words. Now, I want to read that again because I want you to catch the last part. Because it's more than just what you say. You can know all the Bible in the world. You can quote the scripture until the cows come home. Isn't that a statement in Galesburg? I think it is in this farm community. But I'm going to tell you, it's going to take more than your words to lead people to Jesus. You're going to have to do it by your example. Yield myself to God. Come on, read it together. To be used to bring this good news to others. That's where I got the title both by my example and my words. Now go to the middle. You can see in parentheses, this matches step 12. Let's read this together. Having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. Look at the back part again. We carry this message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. Now, I want you to look at verse 24 of Acts chapter 20. Are you there? Say amen. If you're not, say oh me. 
I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation. And so it's going to be up on that screen. If you want to read it with me, you can. But I want you to hear it in this translation because it's so powerful. This is Paul talking. He has just called for the elders of the church out of Ephesus. He's gathered them together. It's a powerful statement that he makes in Acts chapter 20 before we get to this verse 24. But listen to what Paul says. He says, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. What was that work? The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Heavenly Father, I bow my head to you, looking for your anointing, your strength. Lord, believing that this series has really touched and changed lives. Lord, there's times that we think, man, Lord, I don't see anything happening in our lives. And, and Lord, we're shocked at times when we see the principles and the truths, your statutes and your commandments, your word coming forth. Because, Lord, you tell us that you did not come to destroy the law. You came to fulfill it. But, Lord, there would be a difference that would not be written on the tablets of stone. But, Lord, you would write it on the hearts of your people. So, Lord, you're doing a great work, and I can see it. I can hear it. I hear the testimonies. And, Lord, I'm believing that there's a greater work to come. But, Lord, it's all to get to this place where we as your people begin to share the good news. So, Lord, teach us what this means today. And then, Lord, I pray that your people would become available, that we would be ready at all times to share our story, to share what you have done in our lives. I'm asking this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. I want to make a statement to you. And I want you to hear it because this really is the premise of everything that I want to say here today. And you might be shocked when you hear this. And in a moment, I'm going to tell you why you might be shocked. Here's the statement. God wants to use you. God wants to use you. He wants to use your experiences. He wants to use your hurts, your habits, your hang-ups, and he wants to use you to help others. Do you want to know why so many can't take that statement in? I'm going to tell you why. They think that God can only use the gifted. They think that God can only use the talented. They think that God can only use those who have it all together. Can I ask you a question here today? With a lifted hand, do you have it all together? I know I don't. I'm not even close. Do you want to know what I call myself at all times? You've heard me call myself this. Here it is, knucklehead. So people can't accept that statement. Others think that God can only use them when they're strong or when they're doing well in life. Is your life always good? Are you always doing well spiritually? No, of course not. And because people don't think that they're strong enough or they don't think that they're doing well enough, you know what happens to believers? Silence. They zip their mouths closed and they never say a word to anyone about who their Jesus is. What if I told you that you would reach more people with weakness than strength? Would you believe that? You say, Pastor, why would you say that? Well, let me tell you why. You go out and begin to share in your strength. You begin to share when you've got it all together. You begin to share acting like yours don't stink. Can I say that from the pulpit? But I'm going to tell you the response of the people. They're going to say this. Well, I'll never have it like you do. I'm never going to get my life together. I'll never be where you are. And so they'll reject everything you say in your strength. But when you share in your weakness, 
When you share from your hurts and your habits and your hang-ups, here's what people are going to say. You know what? I can relate to that. I can relate to that. You see, church, when we understand that God uses our weakness and pain, I'm going to tell you that life will take on a whole new meaning. You won't be afraid to share in your weakness and in your pain, in your hurt, in your habit, in your hang-up. Because you'll understand that that's what this is all about. Yielding myself to be used by God to bring this good news to others. But how am I going to do it? What are some practical things that I have got to learn as a believer that's going to help me to fulfill this step that God's asking me to take and celebrate recovery? Now remember, church, this is not for everybody. I think it is. But remember, we're going to be bringing in a lot of people. And if you've not listened to these messages, go back into our website and begin to go from message number one all the way through. And you're going to see the process that we're going to bring people through And we're going to see them find that place of recovery in their life. Again, this is the ultimate goal, step eight, principle eight, step 12. So how do we make it practical? Well, I'm going to give you the first point, and you're going to think that I've gone off the deep end. You're not going to understand what I'm saying. So just let me build this and don't think I'm nuts. You already think I'm nuts. I know that. But let me just build this. Number one, I want you to write this down, free will. Free will. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, if you're in Acts, it's just the next book over. Romans chapter 5, and I want you to look at verse 12. Verse 12. Are you there? When Adam sinned, I'm reading this in the New Living Translation. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sin. Now listen to what I'm going to say for a moment. Catch this one, because this to me is powerful. Sin and all that comes with it entered this world from a choice. It was Adam's choice to disobey God. And we see the consequence of that choice. You see, one of the most incredible things when you read God's Word and when you look at what God has given you and me, we find that God gave mankind free will. He gave it to Adam and said, Adam, you've got the choice to either obey or disobey. And that same free will, that same freedom to choose has been given to you and me. But I'm going to tell you the key to free will. Every choice has a consequence. Every choice is like planting a seed. And one day that choice will produce a harvest. And that's why Paul said to the church at Galatia, listen, you will reap what you sow. You see, church, I don't know if we understand this yet, but do you understand that just like Adam's choice affected him and Eve and all of mankind, do you understand that your choice will also affect you and those around you? We hear this statement all the time, well, I'm not hurting anybody. Oh, yes, you are. Yes, you are. You see, when you make good choices, you have good results. When you make bad choices, those choices produce bad results. And I'm going to tell you the result of a bad choice. It's always the same. It's called pain. I was talking to my brother David yesterday. He was telling me about uh, his wife, Sharon, And how, as they raised their two boys, she would make this statement to them all the time. She said, don't ever get involved with something you have to be delivered from. Boy, I hope you caught that. You might want to write that down and tell your kids. Don't ever get involved in something 
you have to be delivered from. I want to say it again. The result of a bad choice is always the same. It's called pain. When you choose to drink, you choose to do drugs, what's the consequence? I'm going to tell you, it's the addiction and the pain that comes with it. When you choose to be sexually promiscuous, what is the consequence? Well, I can tell you, unwanted pregnancies, sexual disease, and all the pain that comes with it. When you choose to commit adultery, what is the consequence? Divorce, broken homes, shattered children, and all the pain that comes with it. Are you catching what I'm saying? You see, our free will allows us to choose good or the pain that comes with evil. To choose up or down, blessing or what? Cursing. It is our choice to live for God or reject Him. It's our choice to do what He says or do what we want. Yet with every choice that we make, it's going to have a consequence, whether it's a blessing or a burden. And I'm going to tell you, the result of a bad choice is always the same. It's called, help me, pain. Pain. Number two, if you're taking notes, why does God allow this pain? Now, this is not an umbrella statement. I'm not answering the why question of what happens and why do these things happen in our lives because nobody has that answer. I'm not talking about the circumstances of life or those sudden unexpected moments that come away. I'm talking about the pain of a bad choice. Why does God allow it. And it seems like, because we hear it all the time for people, well, sin is different. There are some sins different from others. And then we would say, oh no, in God's eyes, sin is the same. And it's so true. But would you agree that maybe the consequences might be different? I would say they are. So why does God allow those consequences? Why does he allow this kind of pain? What good can come from from this moment of my struggle, my pain, my consequence. Well, I'm going to show you something that I think is powerful. Turn to 2 Corinthians 7, and I want you to look at verses 8 and 9. I'm going to read this from the New Living Translation. This is the letter that Paul had sent to the church at Corinth, and now he's going to respond because there's been a reaction to this letter. Listen to what he says. He says, I was sorry at first. When I first wrote it, I was sorry. You ever written a letter to somebody that you were sorry about and wish you'd never sent it? Okay. So Paul is feeling some regret. He says, for I know it was painful to you for a little while. But now, he said, I'm glad I sent it. Not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. You see, church pain can serve a powerful purpose. And we see it in Paul's words. He says that this pain caused God's people to repent and change their ways. Listen to what Proverbs 20, verse 30 says. I read this in the Good News translation. Listen to what Solomon writes. Sometimes it takes a painful situation to make us change our ways. Boy, that's powerful, isn't it? You see, when you read that, you understand that pain does get our attention. Pain is a warning light. It's a buzzer. It's an alarm. It's a megaphone. And it says to us, okay, something's wrong with what we're doing. Something is wrong in our life. It tells us, all right, you're going down the wrong path. You're going in the wrong direction. How many remember the story of Jonah? You remember that story? He's going one way, and God wanted him to go another way. And because he decided that he was going to do it his own way, God sent him his own personal Mediterranean cruise. You remember that story? 
In Jonah chapter 2, verse 2, he's in the middle of this consequence of a bad choice. He's in the belly of the whale. And Jonah tells us that in his distress, in his pain, he called out to God and he said, God heard his voice. You see, God used that distress, church. He used that pain in Jonah's life to cause Jonah to cry out to him, and it resulted in Jonah going in the direction that God wanted him to go. Have you ever read Psalm 119? Have you ever read what David thought about affliction and all the pain that came his way? Did you ever hear the words that he thought God was faithful in that affliction? He tells us in verse 71 of Psalm 119, he says, listen, this suffering that I'm in the midst of, this pain, he said, it's good for me. And then he tells us why. He said, for God used it to turn me back towards him, to turn me back to living God's ways. So you say, well, what good is this pain? I'm going to tell you that God is right in the middle of it to bring us back to him, to get us back on the right path, to turn us back to begin living his ways. You know what? I am thankful for the pain that I endured through my addictions. Because I'm going to tell you, it was my addiction that caused me to cry out to him. And it was in that pain that God changed my life, turned me around, called me into ministry, and I never saw that coming. But that's what God does. If you're in the middle of a consequence right now, hey, listen, know that God is working. He's going to allow some things to happen to you. Things are going to, there's going to be some consequences. But just know that God's right in the middle of it and that God is working. Amen. Amen i got to show you this one. Here it is. God uses our pain. God uses our pain. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and I want you to look at verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. I'm going to read this from the Living Bible. The Living Bible. Listen to what the Living Bible says. God comforts and strengthens us in our hardships and trials. So that when others are troubled, needing our sympathy and encouragement, we can pass on to them the same help and comfort that God has given us. So here is God. He gives us a perfect picture of the result of what he does through our hurts and our habits and our hang-ups. He's working in us. He's comforting us. He's strengthening us. He restores us. And then he says to us, listen, you do the same when you come across those who are also in that same trouble. You say, Pastor, what good can come from the abuse that I've suffered? What good can come from that? I'm going to tell you what good so that you can comfort those who are going through that same abuse. Pastor, what good can come from alcoholism? Well, let me tell you what good. Who would be better at helping an alcoholic than somebody who struggled with alcoholism? What good is it that I lost my job and I went bankrupt? Well, who better else to help somebody who just lost their job and went bankrupt? Who's better at helping parents who have a child, a teenager, who's gone off the deep end than a couple who had a child go off the deep end? What am I saying? I'm saying this. God will use your pain that you've had to endure through life by giving you the opportunity to minister to others going through the same pain. I had somebody come up to me last Sunday. I won't tell you who they are. I love uh, our church. I'll talk more about it in a moment, the transparency and the openness that we see here. And he said, Pastor, I don't understand the drugs and the alcohol, what you went through, but he said, I do understand the pornography and the addiction of pornography. And we began to talk about how God uses what we've been through to help somebody else going through the same thing. 
You see, he can't walk up to you that have been addicted to drugs or alcohol and say, I understand, I know what you're going through, because he wouldn't understand that. I would, but he wouldn't. But he could walk up to somebody dealing with pornography and be able to say, listen, I understand where you are. I understand what you're going through. You see, that's the comfort. That's what God wants to use. Exactly your experience in life so that you can help somebody else. How many know that there's nothing new under the sun? There is no temptation that's taken you that's not common to man. This is common what we're going through. But I want to tell you, most people will keep it quiet. They hide it in the closet, never to bring it out. But God doesn't want you hiding it in the closet. He wants to use it for his glory. Can you say amen to that? I remember the story of Joseph in Genesis, a young man who had to go through so much. This young man didn't deserve the pain that he went through. He didn't deserve to be sold into slavery. He didn't deserve to be accused of trying to have sex with his master's wife. He didn't deserve having to be thrown into prison. And yet through it all, we find one of the greatest truths ever found in Scripture. And here it is. What Satan means for evil, God will turn it for good. You see, that's the end game of anybody who's had to endure the pain of life. God's going to turn it, and he's going to do it for his glory. Not only bringing us through the pain, church, but by using us to help somebody else. Now, pastor, how do we make this practical? How do we do it? I'm going to give you some practical steps that's going to help you as you fulfill uh, this step in this journey, as you walk towards uh, using your pain in ministry, because all of you have been called to ministry. So number one, be ready. Be ready. 1 Peter 3, 15, if you turn there with me, I want you to underline this because Peter is talking to you. He's not just talking to me because we. this is a standing joke among pastors when a pastor gets sick and I call up Pastor Jack at 6.30 in the morning. And the first thing I said to him when I did, it was not too long ago, it was last year when I was battling this appendicitis. And I, what was the first words I said to you, Pastor Jack? Are you re- instant? Are you ready in season and out of season? And you said, yep. I said, good, because you're on this morning. 6.30 in the morning, I called him. Look what Peter says. He says, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you for the reason of your hope. What is Peter saying to you? He's saying this, listen, you have to be ready to tell your story. Remember when I spoke on that message, just tell your story? Remember we talked about witnessing and uh, we talked about evangelism, and, I, and I, I fought against this idea that you got to know the Bible like the back of your hand, and, and if you don't know it, you cannot be a witness for Christ. And remember, I kept saying, no, no, that's not what you find in Scripture. In Revelation chapter 12, how do they overcome the enemy? With the blood of, their, of the Lamb and the word of their what? Their testimony, all I kept saying was just walk up to somebody and tell your story. Well, I don't know where that can be found in the Bible, but let me tell you what Jesus did for me. Tell your story. And that's what Peter is saying. You have to be ready to tell your story. And that's what this principle and this step is all about, where you're ready to comfort someone with the same comfort that God has comforted you with. How did you make it through the pain of your life? What did you do? How did you do it? How did you recover? How did you begin to see the changes that you needed to see take place? In Celebrate Recovery, there are opportunities for those who have been through the program to tell their story, to get up and give a testimony of how God brought them through, and you're going to hear one next Sunday. And it's a form that we give, and it really has a step-by-step way that helps you write down your testimony. If you're interested in that form, we'd love to give it to you. 
And I'm going to tell you why. I think writing down your testimony is key for you sharing your testimony. On this form, there are questions about your past. There's questions about where you are and what's going on in your life right now. And in writing it down, it really does give you the ability to share with clarity all the things that you have been through in life. Again, I think it's important that you write your testimony down. I think it's important because you want to be able to answer somebody if they ask you about where you, you are. How did you go from this hopeless dope dealer to a dopeless hope dealer? And every believer ought to be able to share their testimony and do it concisely and with clarity. So if I walked up to you this morning and said, listen, share with me. Give me 15 minutes. Let me hear your testimony. Could you do it? I'm telling you, church, it's a powerful, powerful tool. I'd love to get that to you so that you could fill that out and really begin to sit down and write out what God did for you. And here's why. I really believe, church, that once you're ready to tell your story, God is ready to use you. God will open up more doors of opportunity if he knows that you're ready if he knows that you're willing. And it doesn't matter where. It could be in a family party. It could be at your workplace. It could be uh, overhearing a conversation at the gas station. It could be in Celebrate Recovery. It could be in the church. It doesn't matter where you do it. What matters is, are you ready? Are you ready to do it? Secondly, be real. Be real. Church, you know that we're all in the same boat. We're all fellow strugglers. Now, you won't find that in a religious church. I was talking to one of the gentlemen that was talking about our Wednesday night men's Bible study, women's Bible study, and he came up to me, and I I can't get the statement out of my mind. He said, you know, this is the first men's Bible study that I've ever joined, ever enjoyed going to. And I was shocked, and I said, really? He said, you know, every other Bible study that we ever had at this church It was always men trying to outdo each other. And you know what? That's what you find in a religious church. Everybody puts on the mask. Everybody acts like something that they aren't. And then they wonder why the church is dying, why they become irrelevant to the community. Church, listen to me. When you share your story, it's really one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Where did you hear that? We're not telling anybody that we've got it all together because we don't. Instead, we're telling them that with God's help, we're getting it together. There's a big difference there. That we're a work in progress. That God is working us in us both to will and do of his good pleasure. That God's not through with me yet. That's powerful, church. You see, we've got to be open and honest about our hurts and faults and be transparent and vulnerable. Can you let the walls down around you? Have you ever been hurt by somebody and put your walls up? I know that I have. Anybody in ministry has walls up because you get hurt so much you swear that nobody will ever hurt you again. But God always brings that conviction to you and said, no, no, just because somebody hurts you, it doesn't matter. Drop the walls. Be vulnerable. Share what's going on in your life. Be honest and open about your hurts and faults. and Be transparent and vulnerable. You say, Pastor, you've been harping on this for nine years and I'm sick of it. (laughs) I'm sick of you saying this. Why have you been saying this for nine years? Because the world will not respond to the self-righteous or the spiritually arrogant. The world will not respond to the self-righteous or the spiritually arrogant. They respond to those who are humble, loving, merciful, and caring. And that's what I love about this church. I'm going to tell you, church, 
I thought our former church was unique. It was such a different church. It was beautiful. But I'm going to tell you, Calvary Assembly is becoming that unique church. We're becoming that place where real people can share real problems without feeling put down or being judged. A church that is safe, meaning that when you come in and you've stumbled and fell, remember what I've said, Christianity, the question isn't will you fall, the question is, is will you get back up? But when you fall, in most places, when you go to church, oh, you're not going to believe Pastor Jeff. He had a major failure. And we as believers kick them and step on them and stomp them and make ourselves feel better because we feel that we're better than they are. That's religion. Not the church of Jesus Christ. But here at Calvary, Man, when we see people falling and stumbling, we reach out and do what Paul tells us to do. Let's bear one another's burdens. Can you say amen to that? Lastly, I want you to write this down. Don't lecture. Husbands and wives, I hope you just heard that one. Don't lecture. God wants you to be a witness and not a lecturer. Obviously, that's a word because word did not try to correct it. He wants you to be a witness, not a lecturer. Why do I say that? Well, let me ask you this. What happened to you when, you're in the, when you were in the pit of pain? Maybe you are today. And somebody walked up to you and tried to lecture you. What happened to you? I'm going to tell you, in your mind, you're telling them off. Are you not? Come on, let's be honest. Have you ever been in that pit of despair and somebody walked up to you to give you a sermon? And what did you think? Up yours. (laughs) Now, I shouldn't have said that, but you know what? If you think it, it's the same as saying it. That's what God's Word tells us. I'm going to tell you what happened. You cut their ear off. And there's nothing worse than hearing a sermon or a lecture when you're in the pit of despair. Do you remember Job's three friends? Do you remember how they tried to comfort Job in his affliction? Did you ever read their words? Read them again. They didn't comfort Job They lectured him. You'd ask, well, pastor, why don't you ever preach from the words spoken from Job's friends? I've been doing this for over 30 years, and not one time have I ever used a sentence, a word from one of Job's friends. You want to know why? Can I tell you why? You say it's in the Bible, yeah, but let me tell you what God said in Job 42, 7. God told him, I'm angry with you because you did not speak for me and you did not say the right things. Well, why would I ever use those words then? Listen, the last thing a person needs to hear is how good you're doing that you have it all together and they don't. Instead, you know what? Listen, church, and I know I keep saying this, but this is the whole point of this principle and this step. Tell them your story. Tell them about what God did for you. Just tell them the good news. Listen, you're not going to believe it, but I was addicted. That's why I keep saying it to you all the time. Nine, nine years, I've, I've just constantly repeated my testimony. Why? To teach transparency. To let you know that I put my pants on the same way that you do. That we're in this thing together. That God wants to use all of us and all of our stories. Just tell them the good news of what God did. And if you will, church, you'll be the reason that you and David and Jonah begin to cry upon the name of the Lord. You'll lead that person to the only one that can save them and set them free. Amen? Amen. Let me conclude with this. 
I think the world is full of people that need to hear from you. I think you have a big circle. You know a lot of people. Uh, we've got one gentleman in this church that every time that I go out for breakfast with him, literally we walk in and it takes him a half hour to come sit at the table because he knows everybody in the restaurant. I could take him to the library. I, I, could, I don't even care. Where we go, this dude knows everybody in this town. I'm talking about a big old circle of friends. Church, listen to me. There's a statement that says this, you're the only Bible some people will ever, ever read. How many have heard that statement? Do you want to know something? Your circle of friends are probably not going to come to this church at first. I believe those that are coming to celebrate recovery will. I want you to look around church because I'm going to tell you that soon and very soon, every spot in this church, chairs all the way to the back, all the way around will be filled. It's going to be filled. This church will be filled. You're the only church that they'll ever know. Remember, the church is not this building. It's not brick. It's not mortar. It's you. You are the church. Take the gospel, the good news message to those that you know. You know the ones that are struggling with the same things that you struggled with? Listen, don't hide it anymore. You walk up to them and say, listen, let me tell you about my dysfunction. Let me tell you where I was. Let me tell you what God did for me. And because they can identify with you, church, they'll hear you. So they might not come to this church at first, but you be the church. That's okay if they don't come and hear me. They'll hear you. You'll be the first pastor. Do you know what a pastor is? Does anybody know what it is? Do you think it's somebody that just gets up behind a pulpit and shares? A pastor is a herald. Do you know what a herald is? It's somebody who stands on the street corner and says, Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. Do you know that you're a pastor? Well, why don't you start pastoring your church? You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. You're the priest of your temple. Why don't you just go ahead and be the church out in your community? Oh, it's my responsibility. That's what we pay you, Pastor. No, listen, what a beautiful design that God gave. That God would create the church so that the church would be everywhere. Not at 432 North Linwood. This is just a place that we come in. This is an oasis. This is where we get the, the balm of Gilead applied. This is where we get our gas tank filled. And we're cheap. It's free. <laughs> and then you walk out and you become the church. That's what this is all about. Let's read this again as you're in Acts chapter 20. Verse 24, it'll be up on the screen. Is it on the screen? It's in your app, then probably. Is it on there? Let's read this together. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Isn't that awesome? Principle 8, if you've got your bulletin, let's read it one more time and I'm going to end. Yield myself to God to be used to bring this good news to others, both by my example and my words. Step 12, having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. Thank you.